YouTube, I'm here with my friend Sean, and uh, Sean, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Sean's made a great presentation about the feasts of the Lord and comparing them with a lot of the signs that are going on in our times. Sean, what can you tell me about what, uh, what you've been putting together? Um, the feasts of the Lord uh, are basically the testimony of Jesus, and they tie in with everything that's coming upon the end of the world and the beginning of the day of the Lord. So I would just encourage everybody to, to pay close attention to this information and study the scriptures to see if the, these things be true. All right. So guys, check out this video, pay attention, and uh, Sean, just thanks so much for putting this all together. It's, it's exciting stuff. Appreciate it. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Okay, so if you're going to teach, you're going to receive this, a stricter judgment. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So pick which one you want to break and teach others to break it also, and you shall be least. Mr. Harold Camping. I think many of us are familiar with this man. Now, do you think that he decided one morning, I want to be a false prophet? No. This was a slow process of his doctrine getting worse and worse over time and probably never being held accountable by those around him. He went from teaching that the wood, hay, and stubble of 1 Corinthians 3 was people who were not saved in the church to having Mormons advertise on his radio station. It's a slow descent. But... If we would follow the word of God, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge, and we will judge according to the scriptures, and maybe we won't get so off base like Mr. Camping. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Let us hold each other accountable to the word of God and not just our feelings. So, how do we study prophecy? Well, the scripture says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It also says, in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So just like everything else in our Christian walk, we look to Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, for all answers. So what is the testimony of Jesus? Well, it is found in the feast of the Lord. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. Now the word feast is the word moed, which means an appointed time. And the word convocation is the word mikra, which means basically a rehearsal. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy rehearsals, even these are my appointed times. Let's take a look at these appointed times of the Lord and these rehearsals. There are seven of them, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. Now each one was started at the Exodus and then was fulfilled during the life of Yeshua. First the appointed time or should I say rehearsal or shadow. This all began at the Exodus. All right, all of the shadow pictures or rehearsals began at the Exodus and when God told them to come out from the Egyptians he had them sacrifice a lamb without spot or blemish and had them paint the blood of the lamb upon their doorpost. That way the angel of death would pass over their house. Now this was a, a foreshadowing of what Yeshua would do later on. And the nation of Israel did this every year on Nisan 14. They would kill a Passover lamb for 1600 years until the fulfillment that Yeshua did. On Nisan 14, the lamb of God without spot or blemish was slain. And his blood was painted on the cross, which caused death to pass over God's people and delivered us from sin. That evening, when the sun went down, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the 15th. Unleavened Bread is considered the bread of haste because it was made in the night that they left out of Egypt. 
Uh, today, traditionally, it has to be baked within 18 minutes, and the process of baking, uh, it gets extremely hot. And so when they take it out, they run it over and pierce it through to cool it down, and this causes bruising and striping. It is also without leaven or flat bread. Uh, yeast represents sin in the Bible, so basically this bread was sinless, bruised, pierced, and striped. The fulfillment is Jesus is the bread of life. He is sinless. He was bruised and he was pierced and he was striped to take away our sins. And just like the unleavened bread went into the oven, Yeshua went down to hell to preach those to preach that those are in captivity, not to suffer longer. The Feast of First Fruits was the day after the weekly Sabbath. At the Feast of First Fruits, you would bring a sheaf of your barley harvest to the high priest, and he would take this and wave it before the Lord as a sacrifice uh, of faith, trusting that he would bring in the rest of the harvest. At the Feast of First Fruits, Jesus Christ became the first fruits of the resurrection. And Mary came to the grave, and she supposed he was the gardener. I believe it's because he was waving the sheaf before the Lord. Also on this day, the first fruits of the Spirit were given to those who believe. Okay, after they came out and went through the Red Sea, the Israelites traveled for 50 days into the wilderness and they came to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God descended upon the mountain in fire and spoke to the people and gave them the law. Every year they would read out of the book of Ezekiel about a rushing, a whirlwind, and the spirit until the fulfillment after the Lord's death and resurrection, 50 days after the resurrection, at the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and gave men tongues of fire at the sound of a mighty rushing wind that came from heaven. So the testimony of Jesus is everything he has done, everything he is doing, and everything he will do on the earth. The first four feasts have been fulfilled, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. The last three feasts are yet to be fulfilled. But the Apostle Paul said, these are a shadow of things to come. And when he wrote this, the first four feasts were already fulfilled, and the last three are the ones he's speaking of. They are a shadow of things to come. Now, the testimony of Jesus is also considered the milk of the word. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even by those, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And brethren, I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Okay, so the scripture teaches us that we cannot go past the milk of the word because we have envy, division, and strife. Now what is the milk of the word? Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of... Here it goes, the milk of the word. Repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permit. Now you'll notice there are six specific items that are given, and the first two, if you put them together, repentance and faith, right there you have your salvation. The next two are only learned after you're saved, because the carnal mind is at enmity with God and cannot discern, discern spiritual things. So after you're saved, you learn of the doctrine of baptisms, notice it's plural, and about the laying on of hands, then the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now in studying the milk, I noticed that there are three groups. Each of the two are connected with each other, repentance and faith, doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands, and the resurrection and eternal judgment are, are linked. Well, the feasts come in three groups. All Israelites were required to be 
at Jerusalem for each of these festivals at Passover, at Pentecost, and at Tabernacles. Now if we look at Passover, we know that it's the death. Unleavened bread is the burial. And first fruits is where Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection. So, repentance from dead works and a faith toward God, we do at the hearing of the gospel, which is the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, the death, burial, and resurrection. So it lines up with the first part of the milk. It's in the past, it's the Passover, and it is our salvation. Next, the Feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon men. The doctrine of baptism and of the laying on of hands. This is God's present work in us. The baptism of the Spirit. What God does through us here on earth. Okay, so the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands is present. And it's Pentecost and it's our sanctification. It's what God is doing through us and separating us from this world with His Spirit. So if the first two match up, I'm assuming the last one will. The resurrection of the dead and of, and of eternal judgment, the future works of God, which is the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. I believe Trumpets has to do with the rapture and the resurrection. Atonement has to do with Israel's atonement. And Tabernacles has to do with the millennial kingdom. Yeshua's reign here on earth to put all enemies under his foot. So you see, we look through what God has already done here on earth and is presently doing in us to see the future of what he's going to do at these feasts. So therefore, the testimony of Jesus is the guideline to prophecy or the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which is also the milk of the word. So I encourage everyone not to be divisional over these issues or you will not go past them. Now let's look at the uh, shadow picture of the Feast of Trumpets. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, which we know is a rehearsal. Now, this feast is the only feast that began on the first day of the month, and it was celebrated by blowing of trumpets. It's been known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the awakening blast, the day of the judgment, the opening of the books, the opening of the gates, the hidden day, the wedding of Messiah, and the coordination of Messiah. All right, <clears throat> the Feast of Trumpets is celebrated for two days, even though it's a one-day feast. At this festival, the shofar or ram's horn is blown, and it's blown 99 times. It's actually blown with a nine distinct sounds in a series of 11 groupings for a total of 99 blows. And then the very last one is a distinct separate sound, and it is called the last trump. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. But I know what you're thinking. You're saying, but no one knows the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. And I agree, we cannot know the day nor the hour. But there's other scriptures that say things like, but the times and the season, brethren, I, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes, at, comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travaileth a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You see, the Lord only comes as a thief to those who are in darkness, or those who are sleeping. Revelation 3, one, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, and thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strength, strengthen the things that which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. 
If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Okay, we seem to have scriptures contradicting one another. One says, you cannot know the day of the hour. The other one says, if you do not repent, you won't know the hour. So, we cannot take any scripture and interpret it by itself. Second Peter 1.20, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is given of any private interpretation. So we know that we must look at all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and marry them together to get a complete understanding. So when I look at scriptures like this and they seem to contradict, I know that I need to look deeper. We also know that the scriptures say in Amos that God will do nothing until he reveal it unto his prophets first. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Okay, first he says, let them for be for signs and for seasons before he says for days and for years. Now the word for signs simply means a signal. And the word season is the word moed again, it's the appointed time. So the sun, the moon, and the stars are for the appointed times. And they're going to give us a signal on when these appointed times are going to happen. Just like the wise men that came to Yeshua when he was born, they followed his star in the sky. The Feast of Trumpets, being that it begins on the first day of the month, it begins at what's called a sliver moon or the new moon. And the way they would watch for this moon is they would send two witnesses to the Temple Mount and they would wait and they would... Uh, wait for the spotting and when both saw it they would run back to the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin would report to the high priest and they would announce the new month has began has began now this is a lunar cycle with the earth here in the center and this is what the moon does it cir circles around us rotates around us and we see different parts of the moon based on the sun hitting it we have a quarter moon and a half moon and so on and all the days of the biblical month are set up on this lunar cycle. A sliver moon is the first day. And about a half moon is around day five. And so on and so on. Till we come all the way around. Till the moon goes dark again. And we can't see it real well. And that's on the 29th and 30th day of the month. Now it's during this time period at the Feast of Trumpets that they would go out and sit and wait and watch for the new moon or the sliver moon. And so they would start the, the festival during this time and they would celebrate it for 48 hours because that was about the time span that the sliver moon could show up. Any time during that time, that 48-hour window, the, the sliver moon could appear. And they always wanted to be found celebrating the feast when it began. So throughout history, that 48-hour window has been known as the day and the hour that no man knows. You see, this is called an idiom. An idiom is a word or phrase that has a literal and a figurative meaning. So the scripture plainly means we cannot know the day or the hour, but it also is pointing to the Feast of Trumpets. If you speak to a Messianic Jew and you say, well, no man knows the day or the hour, and he, he'll automatically think, well, the Feast of Trumpets. You know, we don't know when it begins exactly. We have to watch for the sliver moon. Just like uh, some foreigner may come to America, and if you tell him he has a, a chip on his shoulder, he may think that he literally has a chip on his shoulder. But we know that he just has a bad attitude. The Lord said to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there comes a shower. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it comes to pass. Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? So the Lord wants us to be able to discern the times. Okay, we're going to look at some of the past Feast of Trumpets and some of the amazing things that happened on them. In Second Chronicles chapter 5, we find Solomon finishing the work for the house of the Lord. Now we know everything in the Old Testament is a physical picture of a spiritual truth today. And so let's see what happened at this Feast of Trumpets. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought all, in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Okay, 
Solomon was finished with the tabernacle of the Lord, or the Lord's house, and we know that we are the Lord's house today. So it's a picture of, of us. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month. Now we know that the Feast of Trumpets begins at the beginning of the feast, or excuse me, we know that the Feast of Trumpets begins at the side of the sliver moon in the seventh month, the month of Tishri. Wherefore all the men assembled themselves unto the king in the feast. Okay, God's people are being assembled to the king at the Feast of Trumpets. Also the Levites, which were the singers of all of them of Aspha and of Hermon uh, and of Jeduthun, and you can't say those words either, which their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. Okay, notice they're sounding with trumpets, and they're assembling themselves to the king, and they're all arrayed in white linen, just like we will be in heaven it came to pass as the trumpeteers and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments and music and praised the Lord saying for he is good for his mercy endureth forever that then the house was filled with the cloud even the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister by the reason of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God now this is a beautiful picture of the rapture we are the house of the Lord. Okay, one day, we, the house of the Lord, will be finished. And we will be assembled to the king in the feast, which is in the seventh month. The Feast of Trumpets, I believe. And then we will be arrayed in white linen. Hopefully, we will be found sounding with trumpets as he returns, because we're watching and waiting his coming. And we will be as one, just like they were as one. And at that time, we will be filled with the glory of the Lord as he descends upon us in a cloud. All right, historically, the Feast of Trumpets has been known as the birth of the creation. The new year is in the seventh month, the month of Tishri. It's also known as the time that Abraham, Abraham bound Isaac. And then God provided a sacrifice. He provided a ram caught in a thicket. That's why we blow a ram's horn at the Feast of Trumpets. It's also historically known as the birth of the first Adam. The birthday of the first Adam, which I find interesting... Because unlike traditional teaching, most of us know that Yeshua was not born on December 25th. Uh, if you do a careful study of the birth of John the Baptist through the course of Abijar, you'll find that he was born sometime around Passover, if not on the Feast of Passover. Tradition also says that he was born on Passover. Now we know that Yeshua was born six months after John. So if we look at the Feast of Passover in the month of Nisan and count six months forward, one, two, three, four, five, six, that lands us right around the month of Tishri, to which the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles are in. Now there's been a controversy of whether the Lord was born at the Feast of Tabernacles or another day. You know, the scripture says that he tabernacled among us. The scripture says that he tabernacled among us. Since the time of that argument, we have come up with star chart dating software, which can give us a picture of the sky all the way back 2,000 years ago when the Lord was born. Now, I think God had this in mind that we'd be able to do this. That's why he gave us the signals in the sky. Revelation 12, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Okay, there appeared a, a, a great wonder in heaven. Okay, the first heaven, or the second heaven, um, where the sun, the moon, and the stars are, there was a wonder, or a sign. And it was a woman clothed with the sun. Now, if you look at the constellation Virgo, at the time of the Lord's birth, you'll find that she was clothed in the sun, and there was a crown of twelve stars above her head, and the moon was positioned under her feet one day over a 15-year period back 2,000 years ago. 
and that was on Tishri 1 at the Feast of Trumpets. It was also Wednesday, September the 11th, 3 B.C. I find it interesting that September the 11th has been marked by Satan as an evil day now. I believe it's because he is trying to change the appointed times with his evil appointed times. Now we're going to talk about Planet X. Planet X is what all the 2012 year end of times controversy is based upon. The Sumerians and the Mayans have a very sophisticated astrological system and we were baffled by it when we started discovering these plates and these tablets that it's written upon. We were astounded by it but one problem was that it had a few more planets than we we had on our uh, list of planets. So we liked what they did but we weren't too impressed. Now they told in their tablets that these uh, this astrological information and, and uh, lots of other information were given to them by the gods. They came down from heaven and gave them this uh, understanding. Now from a biblical point of view we know that the whole world used to worship the host of heaven and those were the angels and that's why hell was actually created for those angels who sinned. Now planet X is the twelfth planet which scientists say is undiscovered and, it, and they were wrong about and it was thought to be a, a distant planet on a different um, rotation around the sun than, than what the rest of the planets had. It's believed that it was about on a 4,000 year orbit and when this was all started to come out a lot of people started coming up with theories about how it possibly caused the flood and other catastrophic events over the years. Uh, some people even believe that the asteroid belt used to be another planet but Nibiru destroyed it with his ma magnetic field. This is the supposed orbit of planet X that the Sumerian, Samaritans had on their tablets. It's an elliptical. It's called the planet of the crossing. And here's another picture. Which brings us to today in Comet Elenin. Comet Elenin was recently discovered by a man named Leonoid Elenin in 2010. What's interesting about this comet, here's a picture of it, is a lot of astronomers and people are debating all online about what this supposed comet really is. Some people say it's a brown dwarf star. Other people say, no, it's Nibiru. Other people say it's a, it's a spacecraft. And I don't know much about uh, outer space photography, but this looks strange to me. Some people say these are uh, moons that are following it. It has eight moons. And... Uh, this this picture started a lot of controversy and everybody started saying, hey, well, this is Nibiru. It's that planet that was undiscovered. We can see it now. It's coming at us. And that didn't hold a lot of weight until NASA came out with its um, orbit around the sun and it was on that exact path that the supposed Nibiru planet is on. Here's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA where you can go and follow Comet Elenin. When all this started about, there, there began to be a great controversy between people on the internet and they were saying, some were saying, well, it's probably Nibiru. Others are saying, no, it's just a comet. It's no big deal. It's just a coincidence. And during the argument, uh, some people would say, well, if it was a planet, we would start having really weird weather as it got closer because its magnetic field would affect us. And uh, it would start messing with our magnetic field and, and all kind of bad stuff would happen. This, this year's extreme weather has already cost around $32 billion in damage, where in normal years, around $6 billion. I found that very interesting. But... I'm, I'm a skeptic and I started reading more and, and some of the uh, scientists were saying, well, at certain times we should be able to see this planet. It would probably look like a, another sun in the sky if it's as big as everybody thinks it is. And uh, there's, there's time periods coming up when we'd be able to see it. And it's very interesting because if you go on the internet and YouTube now, there's what's called the two sun phenomenon. It was even on China's television on their news about how they were seeing two suns in the sky. And there's pictures from all around the world of the two sun phenomenon. Now I found that very interesting when I looked that up. So I started paying closer attention. And people started saying, well, they, they had all kind of reasons. You can find a, a, a reason for anything uh, that you want to believe or don't want to believe. So there was some good reasons of why there was two suns in the sky. Most of them didn't make much sense to me, so I looked 
deeper into the study. And people began saying, well, yeah, okay, uh, if this is a planet or a dwarf star, it also would start killing off animals. They'd be dying in mass quantities because of the uh, radiation or, or something, some scientific stuff that's above my head. But I find it interesting that that's exactly what's going on around the world. We have dead birds, dead fish, dead crabs all turning up all over the world in mass quantities. We had mass animal deaths around the world. Dead birds fall from the sky. Millions of fish and crabs wash ashore. Two million dead fish wash up in Maryland. 40,000 crabs in ashore. 40,000 crabs wash ashore in Kent. You can go to Google and they have a map set up that pinpoints all the different places where the mass animal deaths are happening. Now mass animal deaths happen each year but not to this degree. Okay, now we're going to go back to NASA's JPL small body database browser. Now this uh, something NASA has set up to actually track Comet Elenin or what they're calling Comet Elenin and it shows us where it has been and where it is going. And we're going to use this to talk about an issue of alignment. Uh, it's always been said if, if an outside object, such as another planet, would come into alignment with us and another one of our planets, uh, this would cause some disruption here on Earth. It would actually mess with our fault lines and give us earthquakes and other problems here on Earth. So I decided to travel back in time and look and see if uh, we have had any of these events um, with Elenin. Because if it's a comet, uh, the gravitational pull would not be that strong and we wouldn't have any type of evidence. But if it was something else, a dwarf star or a planet, um, when we have an alignment there would probably be some issues here on Earth. So we're going to go to March of 2011 and look at where Elenin is and we see that we had an alignment on this date. Whoops. March 11, 2011. Okay, you have the Sun, the Earth, and Elenin. So the Earth's in the middle, and the gravity from the Sun and the gravity from Elenin are both pulling on the Earth. And on that date, we have. 3-11-2011, an 8.9 magnitude earthquake, the largest in recorded history in Japan. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. Let's see if we can go back in time and find another alignment and some evidence to support these initial findings. So we're going to travel back in time to September of 2010. September 4th to be exact. I'm going to pull out a little bit. And on September 4th, we have another alignment. And this one is actually with Earth, Mercury, the Sun, and then Elenin. Now it's further away, so its pull is less, but Mercury is there with us. And on that date, On September the 4th, 2010, an earthquake strikes Christchurch, New Zealand. It was a 7.0. All right. We're going to go back even further now. All the way back to February of 2010. February 27th. And we see on that date, we have another alignment. If I can get it lined up. Between the Sun, Earth, and Elenin, February 27, 2010. And on that date, <clears throat> we have an earthquake in Chile, one of the strongest earthquakes ever recorded, an 8.8. .8. Now, here's a list of all the alignments and all the earthquakes that have happened over the past couple years. Now, notice most of these earthquakes are above a 6.0. And anything above a 6.99 is relatively rare. And we have had every one of these alignments on the days of these earthquakes. 
These are the future alignments with L and N. Now, earthquakes have been on the rise. If you look at a chart from 1863 to the present, it takes it in 38 year groups from 1863 to 1900, there was only 12 earthquakes that registered above a 6.99. The next 38 years, 1901 to 1938, there was 53. The next 38 years, there was 71. Now, the last 38 years, there has been 164, actually more today, and it's predicted to be up to 190, so earthquakes are definitely increasing around the world. Here's a bar chart that gives a little bit more uh, visual example of how much earthquakes have been increasing. Around this time, the Division of Science and Technology sent a letter to President Obama on October 15, 2010, and it says, the Director of Office of Science and Technology Policy to develop a policy for notifying federal agencies and relevant emergency response institutions of an impending near-Earth object threat. At the same time, we're going to have 20,000 uniformed troops inside the USA. Now, our army is not supposed to interact with us on a, a level of security or, or policing us. They're only supposed to be for outside threats, but that policy has changed. And they're here in case of a nuclear attack or other domestic catastrophe. The total buildup, the response, the 20,000 troops will be at its height in September of 2011. Also, at the same time, NASA has shut down its space telescope. NASA has shut down the space telescope designed to view brown dwarf stars and near-Earth objects. Their explanation is that the lifespan of the craft was based on the coolant running out. Now, this object or this craft has only been in the air for 10 months, and it was shut down right after the news that a brown dwarf-like planet or star was out in the sky. I find that uh, very coincidental. Okay, at this same time, the UN is going to have a debate whether or not they're going to seize Israel in September and divide Jerusalem and establish a Palestinian sta state without negotiation or approval from Israel. And Israel's prime minister has agreed to new peace talks based on the 1967 lines. Those are the border lines before the Six-Day War. Here are the borders at the Six-Day War, and here are the borders after. See, the rules of engagement are that if you win in a war, you take what you win. You keep. That's always been the rules. It's always been throughout history. If you win in a war, whatever land you're on, you keep. This will be the first time in history that any nation has been asked to go back to borders before a war. Benjamin Netanyahu has also said that everything is on the table. He's willing to negotiate everything in Israel. Also, oil has been found in Israel. So if we believe that maybe the United States or some other countries would rally behind Israel, this oil changes the whole topic because Israel is not in OPEC, and OPEC regulates the oil price around the entire world, and oil is somewhat used to control nations or peoples. Israel has claimed that they can produce a barrel of oil for 30 to 40 dollars. Now, that means trouble for a lot of elite people around the world if Israel can pr produce this. So now the entire world has a reason to want to invade Israel. Also, one of these uh, oil reserves was found right on the 1967 borderline. So if they went back to it, the Palestinians would own that oil reserve. <clears throat> but not to fear, in September the Pope is going to visit and meet with the Jews and Muslims. Notice the September month keeps coming up. We're going to go back to NASA's website and look 
at where Com Comet Elenin is going to be in September. If we scan forward to September the 26th, 2011, we'll find that Elenin comes into a complete alignment with the Sun and Earth. Now, common Elenin has an alignment with the Earth and the Sun on September 26th, in which is believed that we will have an eclipse or the Sun will turn dark for three days. Now, it may vary a day or two, so it could be the 26th, 28th, and 29th, we're not sure. But at the same time, there are some other signs in the sky that is going on. Revelation 12, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed in the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. The sign that was in the sky at the, the Lord's birth is going to be in the sky again on September the 29th, 2011. This is very interesting because that is during the Feast of Trumpets. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Luke 21. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distresses of nations, with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, in September, we have some very interesting things happening. Um, there is an event called the Great Awakening, happened on 9-11. It's where supposedly two million people from around the world are going to stand up in opposition against the New World Order and say that they are no longer slaves. Also, the UN may divide Israel... Jerusalem may be divided. There's going to be a troop surge at its peak for a natural disaster relief in America. In September, Elenin's closest alignment and a possible three-day solar eclipse or the sun turning black. There will be signs in the stars on the 29th, which is Revelation 12, and the Feast of Trumpets happens on the 29th, which is the next appointed time of our Lord. All right, what should we do as all these things come upon us? Should we sell off all that we have and go and preach? And I say, only if you're willing to do it if nothing happens in September. You see, the moment you start looking towards September, you are walking by sight and not by faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And hope that is seen is no longer hope. So if you start looking towards September, you are going to be disappointed. There is only one place to put your hope, and that is in Yeshua Mashiach. Ecclesiastes 12.13 Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil.